Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. I really enjoyed our time of singing this morning. It was really good. I could actually hear uh, really loud voices as you all sang together. So that was really encouraging. It really brought tears to my eyes. Uh, also, uh, I want to apologize. I know last week we had uh, we shortened the service and we all went upstairs for the, uh, the installation service for Pastor Paul. Uh, but I think there was a breakdown somehow because they were supposed to have the back rows all empty for you all. Uh, but I heard there was some breakdown, so I think you had a hard time finding seats. So I'm really sorry about that. So hopefully we'll do better next time. Anyway, a little over 11 years ago, I told I was serving at a church in Texas, uh, and I told them that uh, I was going to be stepping down uh, as their English pastor. Um, I'd been at that church for, for 20 years um, and was very happy there and thought that I'd retire there. I thought that I would, I would die in Texas. Uh, but then uh, as time went on, I, I had this very strong sense uh, that my work there was done and that the Lord had something different uh, or, or leading me and my family to another church somewhere else. And we didn't know where at the time, uh, it was a very emotional day, as I told the English congregation, then I told the Chinese congregation, and uh, there's an outpouring of support and love from the members there. Uh, there were different reactions from people. Some were very excited and joyful for us. Others were uh, very sad. Some were kind of upset. Uh, others, uh, shock and disbelief. Others, kind of doubtful, what, what, you know, weren't sure what was going on. And then throughout the weeks afterwards, that, after I made the announcement, uh, I was just emotionally up and down up and down, um, times of extreme sadness, uh, you know, just pangs of grief and mourning. Uh, other times there was, there was a sense of peace, uh, like, like God was patting me on the back saying uh, that, 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 that you're okay, he, just reassuring me that he was with me, that I was doing the right thing. Um, and so I was just sometimes just overwhelmed by the uncertainty of what's going to happen with me and my family. Uh, what's going to happen with the church that I was at? Uh, we didn't know yet again where God was going to bring us, and that was kind of unsettling too. You know, what, what's, where, where, will I find a place to serve? When will that be? How, you know, all that stuff. So it was very unsettling, and um, it was like going into a dense fog, you know, kind of going quickly. Our, our future was very unclear, and you were afraid you were going to hit something hard. <clears throat> I, I remember, you know, uh, telling uh, our daughters this, uh, Karen Keone. We, we sat around the table. Uh, Kara was six, I think. Keone was four. And we had a family meeting, and I was telling them, okay, uh, we're going to be uh, moving somewhere. We're not sure where yet, but we're, we're leaving in this church. God, God has worked for us somewhere else. And you know, initially, Kara started to cry a little bit. She was six years old in first grade. She goes, I don't want to move. And, uh, you know, we understood, so we try to comfort her. Some of you heard the story. We're trying to comfort her. It's okay. Maybe we'll move back to Chicago. We'll be with family. Uh, we don't know. You'll make new friends. And so we're trying to comfort her. She, so she felt a little bit better. Then we asked Keone, well, what do you think, Keone? And she goes, can I bring the bunk bed with us? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's just like that was it. That was her main concern. She, she had our priorities, I guess. Uh, but again, it was, a, it was a very unstable and very uncertain time for, for our family. Uh, have you ever experienced unstable times in your life? Times when you were unsure uh, about the future. There was uncertainty. There's was, there was lots of change where you weren't sure how things were going to turn out. Uh, I'm sure everyone has had times like this in your life, you know. Um, if not, you will encounter those times later on, times of instability, where our lives are shaken. Maybe you lost a job, or, or maybe you lost a loved one, or maybe there's a crisis in your marriage, or, or maybe there's a big breakup, or you're, you're changing jobs, or or you're moving, or there's a major sickness in your family or, 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 or in yourself, or just major disappointments of something that you worked so hard for, suddenly the dream is, is shattered by something. Maybe there's, you're just worried about the political, the economic instability that our country is facing. At times when the future seems uncertain, or your health and your well-being and your safety might be in jeopardy. You never know. How do you handle such situations? Now, during that unsettling time that I went through 11 years ago as I uh, announced that I was leaving the church, uh, that church, there was a psalm that I happened to be going through around that time that really spoke to me as I thought through all that was going on. And God, like God was preparing me for this unstable time. And this psalm was written by King David, and let's see how he handled his unstable situation. So let's all turn to Psalm 62. We have Bibles. If you don't have one, just you can borrow a Bible 
Um, just return them afterwards. I hope that you all bring a physical Bible and look at a physical Bible as you go through these messages. Um, uh, and uh, we're on page 479 in the Church Bible, if you have one. And we're just going to look at how does God, or what are some ways that we can process unsettling times in our lives? Um, for those of you who just joined us, we are in a new sermon series called An Emotional Roller Coaster. Uh, we're just processing the various emotions that you might go through in life. And how does God, uh, or what are some ways that God shows us through the Psalms of how to process these various emotions, whether it be the highest of the high when you're really happy and excited, to the lowest of the low when you're down in the dumps or depressed or discouraged. The thing is, is that none of these emotions are right or wrong. It's just how can we process them in a way that God, uh, that draws us closer to God. Last week, we talked about Psalm 100, where we found that emotions are to be a big part of our worship. And I hope that you are able to engage a little bit more of your emotions a little bit more today as we sang, and that we continue to grow in this. So anyway, Psalm 62 starts out actually with an expression of confidence. Verse 1 and 2 says this, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Now the first word in the original language of this psalm is the word only, or alone, only. It emphasizes that there is no one else or nothing else no one else or nothing else where we can find our security. Okay? Uh, the, the psalmist has not found an answer. He has found the answer. And there is no other. And he waits in silence. Silence has this idea of, of quietness and waiting. So you put this together, the first sentence literally reads, Only to God in silence is my soul. And there's a picture of a person silently waiting patiently for, for the Lord. Uh, this is not a desperate person, uh, not a person who looks like he's in, in dire straits. He's not a person in panic mode. It's a person expressing a calm confidence in the Lord. Silently before the Lord. Have you ever been really silent before the Lord? Uh, it's not easy to do in this world of cell phones and Instagram and Snapchat and whatnot. Uh, I went on a silent retreat. I think I shared about this with you, about this with a lot of you before. Uh, I went on a silent retreat in between ministries about 11 years ago. And uh, from Thursday night through Sunday morning, you were not to talk. Okay, so there's about you know 40 or 50 men that were at this conference or this silent retreat. The only time you could talk was when you met with a counselor. Um, and you, so you'd eat meals at a table. There's like four other people at the table. You're all eating in silence. No talking. You could read a book. Just no need to talk. Introverts would love this sort of thing. Okay? Um, but it took me a while to get used to the silence. Okay? It actually took me about a day or two to actually get used to being silent. I mean, the, 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 the silence was deafening. It was just so weird for me just to be silent and, and just listen to nature and, and things like that. Um, but it was a wonderful thing. In, in the end, uh, God spoke to me in a very powerful way that I had never experienced before. Um, so I'm, I don't think we all can take you know, four days off to do a silent retreat, but nowadays during my times with God, uh, I spend at least three minutes in silence before the Lord, just, just resting in the presence of the Lord. Um, I set my timer for three minutes on my watch just to be silent before the Lord and just to enjoy His presence. And it, it takes a while to get used to doing this. You know, when I first started doing this, it was like very kind of awkward. But again, I encourage you to try it for a month. And see what happens as you just sit silently before the Lord. Uh, and, and see what happens. You know, ask me if you'd like to know more about it or how, how maybe you struggle with it. And we can talk about it together. But uh, yeah, just being silent before the Lord is, I think, a very good discipline to have. So the psalmist continues. And he affirms his confidence in God. He says, he, he alone, again, start, word starts with alone or only, only God is my rock, salvation, fortress, not be shaken. I will not be shaken. This is a picture of security and stability, isn't it? I'd like to have that sense with me, that, that, that I'm standing on a solid rock when whatever I did. Wouldn't you? No matter what situation you're facing, I have a rock, a salvation, a fortress. I will not be shaken. So, so why, why did the psalmist feel this way? You know, maybe he just came off a great victory. Uh, maybe he overcame a huge problem. Uh, maybe he accomplished something amazing. 
okay? Maybe he had just delivered from a dire situation. Maybe he made the three-point shot at the buzzer that won the game. Maybe he made a hole-in-one, yeah, okay, or something like that. So, you know, a lot of times you see the winner express his gratitude to God after a big victory, right? So maybe that's what's going on here. You know, after a lot of times, after something like that happens, it's really easy to feel confident and secure in your relationship with God, right? So what was our psalmist facing that gave him such a strong, secure feeling in God? Well, take a look at verse 3. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Well, the situation that the psalmist is facing looks like a picture of calamity here, okay? This is not a very peaceful situation, is it? It looks like he's being attacked from all sides from those who are out to get him. It says, how long will you uh, attack a man to batter him? And the word for batter him is literally murder him. They are trying to murder him. The idea is that, the idea is that there are people who are after David's life. The psalmist's enemies are plotting to, to take him down. He doesn't know who to trust anymore. They might be nice with their words, and they may be, seem like they're on his side, but inwardly, they want to see him dead. Some feel that when uh, David wrote Psalm 62, that he was running for his life from Absalom. If you remember the story, Absalom, his son, wanted to take his position, and so he sought David's life, okay? He's trying to kill him. So can you imagine feeling peaceful and secure in such a situation when people are out to kill you? I mean, I don't think any of us have people who are trying to kill you. I don't think I've ever faced this situation. Maybe the closest was the time I criticized my wife's cooking. Oh, don't do that anymore. Okay. Oh, but the, or, or the, seriously, the closest thing I could think of was when I was first trombone in the band, and the second chair trombone, who was a friend of mine, wanted to be first trombone, so he kept doing these chair challenges to get my place. Okay, But definitely not th life-threatening. All right. But here's the point. How does David describe himself in verse 3? He's like a, totter, a leaning wall, a tottering fence. Uh, a leaning wall, that, that's something that's about to fall over, all right? A tottering fence. You know, I had one of these back in my backyard in Texas, okay? Uh -huh. We didn't take good care of the fence, and so the fence started to lean over and over, and it was leaning over the driveway, and it was going to kill somebody sooner or later if the nails popped. And so it was just, you never know when it was going to fall over. Um, so these, again, these are pictures of instability. Lots of uncertainty, a lot of unease. It could fall over at any time. And, and, and I think we can all think of situations where, where you felt this way. Again, maybe where you moved to a new school or moving to a new place or having to go through major transitions in your life, losing your job or a loved one, where you just feel this instability. Probably not as life-threatening as David's situation, but still, again, a very unstable time. How might this sense of peace and stability that David have, how can we have that sort of peace and stability in our situations that we face? Well, a couple things that we'll learn as we go on this psalm. First, find your stability. There we go. First, find your stability in the Lord. Verse 5 says this. After describing his unstable situation, David writes, For God alone, my, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So the psalmist repeats the expression of confidence from the first two, situations, first two verses, almost word for word. So he expresses his confidence, then he explains his dire situation. Then you go, whoa, whoa, that's a terrible situation. And then he expresses the same thing again in verses 3 to 4. But now in the context he's facing, you know, it's, it's more remarkable, right? Despite all that is going on, despite the fact that there are people out to kill him, they are trying to take his life, despite the fact that he doesn't know who on earth he can trust, he waits in silence, in perfect peace for the Lord. His salvation, his rock, his fortress, again, is God alone. And he silently and patiently waits for him. When we are faced with unstable times, you know, what's, what's our usual reaction? Well, we try to take action. We want to do something, right? What can we do to steady the ship? You know, maybe bail, throw over cargo, change direction. We have to do something. Or if we're not ready to do something, man, we just 
think and continue to obsess over how are we going to fix this. Here we have a picture again of silence, of serenity, of security, of peace. Why is that? Because David is finding his stability in the Lord, not in his circumstances. So find your stability in the Lord. Second, look forward with hope. Look forward with hope. There's a new concept that's added here in verse 5 that's not in the original verse, uh, not in the verses 1 and 2, where he says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. My hope is from him. Hope carries with it this expectation of something good. There's a sense of anticipation. It's not dread, it's not fear, not anxiety. Hope, looking forward to something. In other words, the psalmist is not a fatalist. Okay? Uh, there are sometimes people who are calm in the midst of a calamity because basically they've given up. All right, Say, oh, well, we're going to die. We're going to die. Might as well accept it. It's over. I'm going to fail. It's not going to happen, right? Kind of like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. I don't know if you saw Winnie the Pooh when you were growing up. But it's all right. I'll be okay. You know, I mean, just a total down and dumps kind of uh, animal. Resigned to the worst. And, and when faced with a situation that's talked about in verses 3 to 4, it would be easy to have this sense of despair. I mean, people are out to get me. It's over. It's over. But with God on your side, you can face such unstable and even hostile times with a sense of hope, that anticipation of what will God do in this situation. Even when things get worse, what will God do in this situation? How can God work in this situation? And that can give a sense of stability in very unstable times. You know, I stepped down from that, my previous church. What was unsettling for us was that we didn't know we were, where we were going. So there was nothing really tangible to look forward to. We just saw this big fog ahead of us. And what we were leaving was a, a great church, um, great people, uh, a, a good ministry, nice home, nice place to live. And we were looking back at that and looking forward with this big fog. And it's just very, very unsettling. But I had to ask as I was going through that, where is my hope? What is my hope in? Was it my comfortable position, my comfortable location, or where God was going to go and what God was going to do as we followed him into the fog? And what we would see on the other side. Verse 8, David writes, Trust in him at all times, O people. Trust in the Lord. He calls on the people to trust in the Lord. Again, trust has a sense of security. And David has reminded us, God is a rock. God is a fortress. He's a salvation. He's a refuge. He's, we will not be shaken. Those are all stability terms. So look forward with hope and anticipation. Verse 8 also says this, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. The third, pour out your heart to the Lord. Pour out your heart before the Lord. What does it mean to pour out your heart before the Lord? Um, the heart is a seat of your emotions and your feelings. Um, and I'd say pouring out your heart is just letting it all out. Just letting it all out. Letting all out your emotions and your affections out before the Lord. It's expressing your true self and your true feelings completely open before the Lord, being completely honest and completely vulnerable before him. And you can do this. Why? Because it says here, God is a refuge for us. He's a safe place. He's a safe place. Now, as I've said before, you know, we, we tend to think that being emotional is a weak thing, right? You know, especially for those of us who grew up in an Asian household. You know, we don't like to show too much emotion because it's seen as a sign of weakness. And we'll only show that to maybe those who are closest to us those that we feel safe with, right? So there's a tendency, like I said, to intellectualize our faith and our relationship with Christ. Uh, we like apologetics, you know, defending our faith, very intellectual. We might like theology, uh, things like that. We might like inductive Bible study, you know, very, very cerebral. But the true, deep, emotional sharing, that can make a lot of us feel kind of uncomfortable, right? Uh, even though when it happens, you know, it really draws everyone closer together when we're able to do that. And it's that emotional bonding, that really draws people together and, and gives us that sense of closeness. But, but this sort of thing rarely happens, right? Only on certain occasions. And I think this is true also for our relationship with God for a lot of us. I mean, have you ever just let it all out before the Lord? Do you feel that you could let it out before the Lord if you needed to? Just pour out your heart. Pour out your emotions. Just let him know what's going on. 
fully, emotionally, spiritually, all that's going on in your heart. I don't know about you, but up until that time that I had gone through this turmoil thing 11 years ago, um, I didn't think I had truly ever poured out my heart before the Lord. And at that time, you know, I'd been a Christian for 40 years, still hadn't really poured out my heart. And maybe because I'm a guy, maybe, maybe ladies are, are more able to do this better. But, but during that time as I was stepping down and, and going through this fog, um, there was a couple of times just letting it out all before the Lord. Um, frustration, anguish, anxiety, sadness, uh, grief, love, affection, deep desire, you know, all are fair game, okay? The idea of just being completely raw, open, honest, and vulnerable before the Lord. Of course, with a sense of reverence and respect because, because he's God. And for me, that really added a sense of intimacy and closeness. Um, to the Lord that I had not experienced before that time. Again, the tendency for us is to really intellectualize our faith and to intellectualize our prayers. You know, I know my prayers tend to be a lot more cerebral, right? It's about kind of telling God facts instead of expressing our heart. And sometimes, you know, we might not be as expressive to the Lord because maybe we're afraid uh, that he might not grant our prayers and so we tone it down so we're not so disappointed. Maybe that's how you are. I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to be emotional in order to be for God to hear you, or that the more emotional you are, the more uh, God will hear your prayers, or the better your chances of your prayers answered. I'm just saying, don't be afraid to include the emotional element in your prayer life, especially as you're going through difficult and unstable times. You know, God gave us emotions, and now I, I think it honors Him when we use them in building our relationship with Him. So when was there a time when you poured out your heart before the Lord? Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid. Why? Again, verse 8, God is a refuge. He is safe. He is safe. So you can pour out your heart to him. I know sometimes, you know, when you're going through a difficult struggle, you feel you need to vent, right? You need to vent to a friend. So you find a really close, trusted friend, and you vent. You just lay it all out before them. My encouragement is don't just do that. That's okay, but also vent to the Lord. He's the first person we should vent to. Okay, so pour out your heart to him. The next, don't seek stability in the wrong things. Verse 9, those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. So what, Paul, what David's basically saying here is don't trust in men. Don't trust in men. People of low estate, people of high estate, this is the spectrum of everyone. From low to the high, they are all basically nothing compared to God. All right? This is not saying that people are worthless, okay? It's just that they are pretty insignificant and not worth putting your trust in. In the eternal, internal scheme of things, all of us are so minute and so small. We're just like a breath of wind, is what David is saying. Unfortunately, a lot of us really put our trust in people. Maybe our security and our stability is in what people think about us or, or our reputation. Or maybe our security is found in people who like us, you know, uh, our family, our friends, our, our loved ones, or maybe our spouse, maybe our children, uh, maybe your, your church. Or, or, or maybe our trust is in politicians or, or in athletes or, or pastors or our parents. But they all disappoint, and eventually they all die and pass away. So don't put your trust in men. Then in verse 10, First part says, put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. So don't trust in ill-gotten gains. You know, hopefully not this is to describe any of us, but many are where they are because of the fact that they exploited or they cheated others or took shortcuts. And oftentimes when you're feeling unstable about things, you want to do some things like that. How can I cheat to get ahead? Maybe take some shortcuts. Don't trust in those ways. Second half of verse 10 says, uh, if riches increase... Set not your heart on them. In other words, don't trust in your accomplishments or your riches. Again, oftentimes our stability is found in the size of our bank accounts and our investments. Or the idea that we might seek stability in our own comfort. And that was, again, was a big part of the lesson I was learning back in Texas. I was very comfortable serving at my church there. Yeah, there are many challenges, but you could say they were comfortable challenges. Okay, because I was with, in it with my church family. And there was a great deal of comfort being with them as we went through the challenges that we went through. 
But then when I thought about, man, I'd have to go to another church, uh, there'd be different people, there'd be different, different staff, different buildings, different way of doing things, different buildings, all different types of things. It was unsettling because for the past 20 years, my previous church was it. So I had to ask myself, is my stability anchored in God or is it in the church that I was at? And I need to make sure that it's anchored in God because God doesn't change. As the song said, he stays the same. He is the everlasting God. And people may change, surroundings might change, but God doesn't change. So put my trust in him and seek stability in him, not in unstable things. Lastly, remember God's character. Remember God's character. Verse 11. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. So here's a reassuring thing that we need to know. This is why we can trust in the Lord. That's why we can find our stability in him. First, God is strong. Okay, power belongs to God. Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite verses. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's our God. He is able to do immeasurably beyond all that we ask or think. This is the God that created the universe. This is the God that created you and created me. He defeated sin. He defeated death through Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for our sins. With God, all things are possible. He is able to deliver. That's the person I want on my side. So God is powerful. But also, not only that, but it says in verse 12, and to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. So God is not only powerful, but God is also loving. To him belongs steadfast love. So he cares. As strong as he is, he cares deeply for you and for me. As an insignificant as we are, God loves you and me enough to send his son to die for you. And it says in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. And because he loves us, he wants what's best for you. And yeah, it might be difficult what's best for us. It might be hard. It might be unstable at times. But in the end, he wants what's best for you because he loves you. And so you put these two concepts together, you see that the almighty God of this, and creator of this universe is on your side. He is on your side. And lastly, we find out that God is also just and fair. You will render to a man according to his work. If your instability is caused by people who are oppressing you, like David was, then the encouragement is that God sees everything. He knows what you're going through. He will make things right in his way and in his time. So don't resort to their tactics of lying and cheating and exploiting. God will reward your righteousness. Trust him. And then if your instability is caused by a difficult situation that you are facing, then the encouragement is that the Lord will reward those who trust him. So look to him. Spend time with him. Don't Ignore him. If you're spending more time worrying about the situation than praying and spending time with the Lord in his word, that might be an indication that you're really not trusting him. <coughs> now, there's a big difference between a gaze and a glance. A gaze is to look at something intently. A glance is to look at something quickly. Okay? Um, and when facing difficult situations... I think we tend to gaze at our problems and glance at the Lord, right? Oh, man, I got this big exam coming up, God. I need you. Oh, man, I got this big exam. Help me, Lord. Oh, man, I, I, how am I going to study all these things? Help me, Lord. Oh, man, how am I going to get through this? Or, man, I, I got to find a job. Man, I can't find my job. Help me find a job, Lord. Oh, man, what am I going to do? I got to What am I going to interview? Where am I going to get clothes? You know, all these things that you worry, you just glance at God and gaze at your problem. You know, you read this psalm, only two verses in the psalm talk about the problem that he's facing. The rest of the psalm is about who God is and the godly truths about him. So we see here the psalmist is gazing at the Lord and glancing at his problem, even though they're trying to kill him. 
he's continuing to gaze upon the Lord. And as a result, he gazes upon his rock, his salvation, his fortress, the God who is powerful, who is loving, and who is just. He's able to find stability in very unstable times because of where he's looking. So make sure you gaze upon the Lord. Just glance at your problems and see what God does. Another one of my favorite verses, I have many, many, <laughs> is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> now this promise was given to Judah. Judah was a nation that was facing a very dark time in their history. They had been conquered by the Babylonians, and they were in exile in Babylon. Okay, so very, very dark time. Very, very time of national and spiritual embarrassment and humiliation. But God gives them this promise in the midst of all that, that, that in this unstable and dark time, God reminded them that he was there and that they still had hope, that he still had a plan for him, for them. And that message then is the same message now, that we can trust and hope in him, that we have eternal life to look forward to. Yeah, we might lose in this life. We might suffer in this life. We may die in this life. People are persecuted all around the world for their faith, and many lose their lives. But there is a future and a hope that they will enjoy for eternity. And they will say, when you meet them up there in heaven, even though they lived a short life for their faith, that it was worth it. That it was worth it. So I hope this has encouraged all of us as we are facing or will face unstable times, that you would find your confidence in the Lord, to put your trust in him, to find your safety, your security, and your stability, not in things of the world or people of this world, but in the Lord. Let's bow for a moment. <clears throat> what is God saying to you this morning as we looked at this psalm? of a person, David, who is going through a very unstable time in his life where people are out to kill him as he found his stability in the Lord. And as you think about maybe a situation you're going through even now, how have you been handling that? Or how have you handled these unstable situations in your past? What make up God be saying to you this morning? Maybe he's asking you to find your stability in him. <clears throat> maybe to spend some time in silence. <clears throat> or maybe to look forward with hope. Maybe you've been filled with doubts. You've you know, been more pessimistic than optimistic. And you've been putting your hope in situations or in people or in things. Maybe God is saying, put your hope in Maybe God is just asking you to pour out your heart to him. To just be vulnerable and open. Let it all out to him so that he might minister to you. Maybe you've been seeking stability in the wrong things, people. Maybe you've been doing things under, underhandedly or taking shortcuts just relying upon your own comfort. You need to repent of that. Or maybe you've forgotten God's character. You've forgotten that he is strong and that he is loving and that he is just. Maybe you're, God is saying, you need to meditate and think about that a little bit more this morning. So what is God saying to you and how might you respond in worship to him? Just take a moment.
Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. Grace was once defined to me as God is for you. And we thank you so much that you are for us. You are on our side. And Lord, each and every difficult situation we face, Lord, you are using that to, to, to develop us, to grow us, to help us to experience more of you. So Lord, I pray that like David, we would just glance at our problems, but fix our gaze upon you. And as we do so, we would find stability. That we would find you to be our rock, our fortress, our salvation. That we would not be greatly shaken. Because our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. And we wait for you and we obey you. And we find you to be our refuge. And so Lord, help us to encounter you and experience you in awesome ways. As we fix our gaze upon you. It's in Jesus' name.